The Pharmacaea of the Twelve Labors of Heracles. The Twelve Labors and the Procession of the Zodiac. The Twelve Labors and the Procession of the Zodiac. Heracles as a personification of the sun moving through the constellations. This originates likely from Neolithic shamanism and Near Eastern fertility cults. Each labor represents a zodiac constellation. So there are 12 labors, 12, constel or 12 zodiac constellations. I found an article that ordered them and compared them accordingly, and it seems pretty accurate, so you can check out that article, and I'm going to be basing it off of that as I can agree with their conclusion. So in order of the zodiac, we have Leo, which is the Nemean lion, Virgo, the Aramanthian boar, Libra, the horses of Diomedes, Scorpio and Cerberus, Sagittarius, the Symphalian birds, Capricorn, the Cyrenian hind, Aquarius, the Augean stables, Pisces, the apples of Hesperides, Aries, the belt of Hippolyta, Taurus, the Cretan bull, Gemini, the cattle of Geryon, Cancer, the Lernian Hydra, I apologize if some of the pronunciations are wrong. There's a lot of words to consider. Um, the backdrop of the Twelve Labors, Lycanthropy. Ancient rituals from Mount Lycaea reveal human sacrifice and wolf transformation with connections to divine communication via entheogen neurotransmitter mushrooms. Rituals were done at night during certain times of the year, often following thunder. Uh, over here in the Peloponnese, you have Arcadia and Mount Lycaon, which pretty much just means Mount Wolf or Wolf of the Mountain, something like that. You recognize um, Athens, Corinth, Mycenae, Sparta, Olympia. Further below, you have Crete, some archaeological remains of these um, lycanthropy ritual places. They worship this Lycos Zeus, the wolf Zeus, as part of their um, kind of wolf transformation rituals. And you can just read a little bit about it if you want to start off on Wikipedia there. Heracles the werewolf. Heracles was poisoned by Lyssa, the goddess of rabies, who was sent by Hera. Heracles murders his wife and children in a bestial rage. The themes of domestication and ferality of the wolf are obvious here. The toxin attributed to Heracles' madness is the Aconitum lycoctonum, or the wolf's bane. This was called so because they would often use wolf's bane to hunt wolves. And so you can see that there's um, this dynamic of domesticated dogs and feral dogs or wolves with poison and the lycanthropy and the lycanthropy of the um, Arcadians here, of which the Peloponnese is where we get the stories from Heracles, so that's also important to know. In um, some iterations, Heracles kills his family after he completes the Twelve Labors and summits before the Twelve Labors. But either way, he essentially takes on a wolf form and murders his family. And we see personifications of diseases here, like with Lyssa. And we have this connection of poisons and toxins with creatures and with this domestication aspects. Lycanthropy continued. These themes of wolf mimicry and shamanic ritual give us the medieval idea of the man-eating werewolves that we know, as well as it being the central theme to the founding of Rome. We have Romulus and Remus being raised by the she-wolf. Wolf worship can be observed in many other ancient cultures as well. The lycanthropy rituals were observed up until the 2nd century AD. Little Red Riding Hood is a folkloric derivative of these lycanthropy mushroom rituals. Um, you can read all about wolf and lycanthropy in Greek mythology with this link here. Lycanthropy and domestication. 
there are no surviving accounts from Arcadia where the lycanthropy rituals took place. The rituals may not have been as brutal as writers like Pliny, Plato, and Pausanias make them out to be. Human sacrifice may have been misinterpreted for just entheogen, consum entheogen consumption. Whether or not human sacrifice was involved, um, it's pretty clear that entheogens were probably involved as well. Um, there are other instances of entheogenic human sacrifice rituals, so it's not out of the question, but there's just probably no way to verify it. Regardless of the cannibalistic themes central to lycanthropy or ritual use of herbs and poisons, as we've seen, about the Arcadian tribe. The Arcadians are one of the earliest Greek cultures, and they were known for their connection to nature. Arcadia literally means harmony with nature. Arcadia is home to Pan, the god of the wild, shepherds, and music. Depicted as a satyr, Pan is a symbol of man and nature in harmony. Again, this is Arcadia, roughly the region. It's important to understand, I think, that nature, kind of shamanic origins of this region and the myths that are derived from this region. Arcadian mythology. Lycaon is a king of Arcadia who was turned into a wolf. Callisto is his daughter who was turned into a bear and shot and killed and became the constellation Ursa Major. Hermes, the father of Pan and a messenger of the gods, is also a fertility and shepherd god. Hermes is equivalent to Odin, Mercury, Thoth, Anubis, and Terms, who is an Etruscan god. Evander is another son of Hermes, who founded the city of Palantium, which would later become part of Rome, giving the Romans many of their Greek myths, legends, and history. So from this shamanic nature tribe in Arcadia, you have a significant city, which would later become part of Rome, and that ties a lot of their mythology to Greek and it gives them a lot of their stories from these um, people. And you also see these, this idea of animal, of human animal transformation that corresponds with constellations. Arcadia mushroom culture. The Arcadians are thought to be the original inhabitants of the Peloponnese region. Their clothes were probably similar to nearby Mycenaean, Minoan, and Phrygian clothes, which were mainly animal skins, sometimes patterned with dots, as you can see here and here. The iconic Peleus and Patassos are these hats. This is the Peleus, and this one on the right is the Patassos. Other than the obvious shape of their hats resembling a mushroom cap, Many linguistic and artifact remains depicted mushrooms, such as this Etruscan mirror, which shows Ixion on a revolving wheel, which is ultimately an analog of the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Ixion grew fond of Hera, according to the mythology, and was fooled by Zeus into having sex with a cloud that he shaped to look like Hera. And from that union with the cloud, the centaurs were born. Ixion was cast out of Olympus with a thunderbolt and punished by being bound to this fiery wheel for eternity. Uh, themes of sacrifice and kind of these hybrid children are commonplace in Amanita lore and mythology. We see that over and over again. This punishment, just like Prometheus, like Jesus, and being bound to a fire wheel is pretty standard mushroom symbology. We'll take a look at this again later. Ancient Greek mysteries. The Bacchanal, Dionysian, Illusionian, Lycanthropic, Apollonian, and other ancient Greek mystery cults had deep roots that crossed over and blended with other Mediterranean civilizations, and these are where Greek and Roman mythology ultimately originates. The telling, practice, and belief of the, these rituals that survived evolved and were interpreted by historians that lived contemporary or after these cults died out. There's not a lot of direct first-hand accounts of many of these mystery religions, 
we have people who wrote about them and maybe some offhand information, but a lot of it is up to the interpretation of the people who who lived or discovered them. Some common factors include Near Eastern and African influences, fertility and shamanic roots, and an emphasis on everyday life and culture heroes. So a lot of real people were made into and incorporated into the mythologies of the Greek and Romans. You also have um, th them being used as moral codes, as um, references to historical events and, and just your everyday life style. So they were deeply important to the people of these regions who practice these beliefs. Now back to Heracles. Many of Heracles' labors take place in the Peloponnese, issued by Eurystheus, a Mycenaean king. Remember that Mycenae was founded by Perseus, who planted the Medusa stone into the ground, founding the city. Medusa was a mushroom, and Mycenae gives us the word for mycelium. Just in the setting alone, we can see important mushroom themes in the story of Heracles. We have that region rife with mushroom symbology down to their clothes and the name of their city, as well as their founding myths with Medusa. And creatures such as Medusa, anytime you see winged snakes, you're often dealing with Amanita motifs such as, as well as sun, dragons, themes of death, thunder, stones, sometimes lilies, flesh. We will see these repeated throughout the Twelve Labors. The first labor, Leo, the slaying of the Nemean lion. Heracles slays the Nemean lion, skins it, and wears its hide. This is important to the story of the domestication of cats, which is a parallel to lycanthropy. Both the cat and the dog were sacred animals. The zodiac begins with Leo and lasts 30 days. Heracles took 30 days to slay the Nemean lion. We see a similar motif with the hide of the Nemean lion as with the golden fleece. This idea of flesh, of a golden flesh, giving all kinds of powers. Both represent the flesh of the golden Amanita mushroom. A related species of the Amanita is the Pantherina, which was named after the which was named after the panther cat, which shows there is some relationship to this mushroom, to, to cats, to felines. Cat worship goes hand in hand with mushroom cults, the underworld, and spirits. Even today, psychedelics are associated with felines in pop culture. I have the labors on, you can find them pretty much anywhere, but I just linked a website that I was referencing for just the standard Greek telling of the Twelve Labors, so you can check that out. But after killing the Nemean lion, Heracles wears the hide of the lion pretty much throughout the rest of his life. He kind of embodies that animal, feline, domestication. The second labor, Virgo, the Aramanthian boar. Heracles meets his centaur friend, Pholus. They eat a meal and open the centaur's wine, against Pholus' warning. Now, the centaurs had some sort of special wine, and the other centaurs smelt it and were angry that all their wine was being drunk. And also remember that centaurs are the children of Ixion, who was also the king of the Lapiths. The Lapiths were a people whose name meant sons of stone. It's a word that comes from lapis, meaning stone. And it's where we get the popular gemstone lapis lazuli. It means a speckled stone. The name was a moniker for the Amanita, being called the spotted or speckled stone. The centaur's special wine is likely a brew involving this mushroom, putting centaurs in the same category as other Amanita folk creatures, such as the gnome, the elf, and the fairy. We saw this with their creation of um, Ixion and the cloud. There was a cloud, which probably implies rain, and then Zeus's thunder, which is almost always in reference to the Amanita mushroom or mushrooms of some sort. Heracles chased the centaurs away and killed some with poisoned arrows. 
Folis was suppressed by the poison, by the potency of the poison, and accidentally gets himself killed. Finally, Heracles makes it to the boar and traps it in snow and captures it. The snow is an analog of the Milky Way. We will see this more later on. The third labor, Libra, the horses of Diomedes. So Libra is all about balance and balance in the equinox. It's also the season of winemaking. Horses and centaurs are central themes to this labor as well as this constellation. The centaur constellation borders Libra. And the horses were also created by Poseidon. So you have an interesting dynamic of a change in season, season, a critical change in the season with winemaking and horses and centaurs as well, which is kind of that balance of man and horse. You have the Roman god Liber, who is who is like the constellation Libra. And I believe it's where you get words like libation, celebration, liberty, as well as liberty cap. This idea of um, being intoxicated, of celebrating with wine, of even a specific mushroom bearing reference to Libra or the Liber time period of some sort of psychedelic drink, just wine in general with these horse centaurs who to the Greeks here represented these, this time of merrymaking and of probably brewing many of their special drinks. The fourth labor, Scorpio, Cerberus. Scorpio is a three-pronged constellation. Uh, Cerberus was a three-headed dog with the tail of, the dra of a dragon and filled with snake heads on his body. Scorpio represented the beginning of the dark months which was the sun's journey into the underworld. As the season started to get darker and the days were getting shorter. The underworld realms were often related to psychedelic experiences, as well as dreams and the souls of the dead. Dreams, psychedelic experience or drug experiences, and where they believed dead people went, they were all one and the same. They were, there was this sort of realm that were all connected. Heracles, to reach the underworld, needs the help of an Illusionian priest. Scorpio is also an important growth season for the Ammonites and Muscaria. That's usually when they begin to fruit. It's during these colder months, at least in some parts of the world. It's also noted in that article that scorpions don't really live in this area, so the three-headed dog with a dragon tail is kind of the equivalent of, of that idea of a scorpion and embodies the same characteristics. The Illusionian Mysteries, the most famous of the Greek mystery cults, we focused on the underworld with gods such as Demeter, Persephone, and Hades. They had an unknown drink called Kikion, it was consumed during initiation rituals. There are many proposed substances for these, for the ingredients for this drink, such as psilocybin and ergot. Heracles needed this help to reach Cerberus in the underworld, further showing the connection between mushrooms and the underworld. Pomegranate is a common analog to the Amanita muscaria, which is Persephone's sort of fruit that she is associated with. So you have Heracles who needs to reach the underworld to get to Cerberus during these dark months, but this is the period where Amanita would lo most likely to be to be harvested during this period, or to be used. This is a very specific time because the mushrooms won't last long before they're eaten or they rot out. So the timing I think is critical in relating the Cerberus labor with the Amanita Muscaria and the underworld themes. The fifth labor, Sagittarius, the Stymphalian birds. The Sagittarius constellation is depicted with a bow, and two bird constellations actually border the Sagittarius. While the bow is a common weapon that Heracles uses, this labor seems to feature it the most, and the surviving art shows Heracles with a bow. Toxic etymologically comes from the Greek 
toxicon, meaning arrows or archery, and toxon from bow or arc, as in like rainbow, an arch. The idea of toxic arrows is pervasive in Heracles' labors and many other Greek myths. Intoxicant is an obvious de derivative word implying a deep lore in herbal poisons related to hunting. Poison and potion are related as well, giving us more context into what is considered poison, something harmful, and potion, which is something healing. Toxic arrows, as a symbol of herbal knowledge and hunting, is imperative in decoding the shamanic and entheogenic roots of mythology. The sixth labor, Capricorn, the Cyrenian hind. A hind is a female red deer. Deer are sacred animal to Diana, goddess of the hunt and the moon. Again, you have this repeating motif of archery and hunting. The Cyrenian hind had special golden horns and hooves. This is probable Amanita illusion. No antler of doe existed in Greece, so the use of a goat, a Capricorn, is fitting as it related to the zodiac constellation. And maybe there's some other reason why they were sort of conflated. Um, of course, red deer also eat Amanita. They are known to do that. And again, you have repeating themes of archery, hunting, and toxins. The seventh labor, Aquarius, the Aegean stables. Cattle are highly revered in almost every culture and religion of the ancient world. The galaxy was named after milk, hence why we still call it the Milky Way. The origin of this story is in the myth of Heracles. As a baby, Heracles was left to die by Hera, but Athena found the baby and brought it to Olympus where she tricked Hera by saying she found a random baby. Hera's Maternal instincts kicked in as she nursed the baby, but Heracles suckled too hard and the milk spilled out, creating the galaxy. Cows have symbolic significance with milk, flies, fertility, and mushrooms, which in turn represent the underworld, the galaxy, life, and death. And then you have cow dung and psilocybin having that sort of special relationship. You can read kind of more about the origins of the Milky Way in this link here. But cows, and especially in religions like Egypt and even India, you have them as these sacred animals because of their association with milk, flies, fertility, and mushrooms. Fly agaric and the Milky Way. Using fly agaric with milk to attract flies is an ancient practice. Special drinks were likely created with milk and fly agaric as well to consume. The illusion of the Amanita as a breast, a phallus, a yoni, the galaxy, the underworld, and many different animals, gods, and weather events such as thunder and the sun give them a myriad of interpretations and mythologies for this specific fungus. The Amanita was literally seen as a microcosm of the universe and the access to prophetic divinatory and fertility rituals. Themes of milk and honey, water and wine are prevalent across other religions such as Judaism and Christianity as well. An anthropomorphism of many folk and myth creatures, you have the snake, birds, stone, etc. on top of all of these listed up here. And no doubt the white scabs of the Amanita were compared to stars in the sky. The seventh labor, Aquarius, Aegean stables continued. The Aquarius constellation's command of water is of course implied in the name of itself implied in the name itself, Aquarius. This flowing of water is observed in the constellation. Heracles performs this task just as the flowing milk of the galaxy. The eighth labor, Pisces, the apples of Hesperides. The golden apples were guarded by daughters of Atlas and a dragon, and a multi-headed dragon. The story resembles that of the Garden of Eden and Pandora's box. Heracles tricked Atlas into retrieving the golden apple and bears the weight of the world until he fools Atlas into holding it again. There are many Amanita allegories encoded in, encoded in this story. A garden with golden fruit, a dragon, nymphs, and even Atlas is an Amanita mushroom personification. 
Heracles as an anthropomorphism of the sun processing through the constellation and an amity to personification gives us many details of the garden motif that few other religions have kept. It must be understood that these stories are retellings of far more ancient stories, and so it may often appear redundant when viewed as entheogenic folk myths. But remember that the unique experience and different cultures and languages create these complex myths based on interpretations, the passing on of tales, and obscure metaphors, zoomorphisms, and deifications of these secretive, unpredictable neurotransmitter organisms of which there was no universal name of. The Ninth Labor, Ares, the Belt of Hippolyta. This confrontational labor fits the Ares theme of conflict and the Amazons who were warrior women. Amazon means missing one breast, and this single breast is a reference to a mushroom. Even the shield of the Amazon warriors is a cap dome shaped with spots, which you can see right here. The constellation associated with the horse riding Hippolyta is the same as Andromeda and Pegasus constellation, which borders Aries. Pegasus, Andromeda, and Aries. And then again, you kind of have this theme of a centaur, of a human and a horse as well as a single mushroom motif, similar to Odin's single eye, which was referenced to the visionary aspect of the mushroom. You also have the sort of fertility aspect of the mushroom, which was seen as a fertile breast growing from the ground of Mother Nature. The tenth labor, Taurus, the Cretan bull. The bull, like the cow, has important symbology, especially to the Minoans of Crete. The bull was sent by Poseidon to be a sacrifice offered by King Minos, but King Minos instead spared the bull due to its beauty. Poseidon was angry and made the bull rampage through Crete and even made Minos' wife fall in love with the bull, which, which, then, which she then gave birth to the Minotaur. After that, Minos had to build the labyrinth to contain it. Heracles just comes in and easily wrestles the bull and completes this labor. You have Heracles represented as Orion, and then you have the Taurus, which is the bull. The um, connection to King Minos and Minotaur in the labyrinth with Poseidon is interesting in and of itself, but not, re not, but not really related to Heracles' labors. The eleventh labor, Gemini, the cattle of Geryon. This labor gives us an interesting geographic explanation. The creating of the Strait of Gibraltar by splitting a mountain in two, or by creating two mountains separately, depending on the storyteller. These are the pillars of Heracles represented as the mountains. The theme of two is already present here, matching the Gemini constellation. Heracles fights off a two-headed dog, Orthus. Geryon is a multi-limbed giant killed by Heracles' arrow. Two sons of Poseidon try to steal the cattle afterwards. One cattle temporarily escapes Heracles and is what Italy is named after, which was the native word for bull, Italis, furthering this Roman-Greek connection. A fly sent by Hera disrupts the herd and scatters. Heracles must gather them once again. We see the theme of fly with bovine creatures playing an important role. The twelfth labor, Cancer, the Lernian Hydra. The Hydra is a multi-headed water snake. Um, then you have Carcinos, who was a crab that came to the aid of the Hydra and who was killed by Heracles. Uh, the crab became the constellation Cancer. And our word for Cancer comes from Carcinos. Cancer used to be called a canker. This is because the effects of cancer and the shell of a crab. They were similar and they were called, and the disease was named after the crab because of that association. The hydra bears similarities to the medusa and the dragon and the multi-headed dragon from the golden apples. There is that, there is again that theme of snake, whether it was multi-limbed or flying along with 
themes of poison and mushrooms. When Heracles finally kills the Hydra, he dips his arrows in its blood. I think it's also interesting, um, you have two words here, Hydra, which is the multi-headed dragon, and Hypha, which is the mycelium of a fungus, the root system of a fungus that grows. I can't necessarily prove this connection, but you have Hydra, which ultimately comes from a word that means wet. You have Hypha, which ultimately comes from a word that means web. They're very similar in concept and in function and form, and the illusions of other snake creatures and mushrooms and poisons certainly may indicate that the Hydra is no different. But as we've seen, there's this interesting relationship between fungus and water, as well as stones. You have Poseidon who creates horses, who ultimately become centaurs, and you have them connected with fungus. And then you have crabs, which are these sort of fungal-like animals. Carcinogen, to something that is a carcinogen, causes cancer. What it means is becoming a crab. You're becoming crab-like. It's that same root as cancer and carcinos. Carcinization is this evolutionary trend toward animals becoming crustaceans. Now, this is due to some sort of fungal relationship, seeing as fungi produce chitin. Cancer recognized as chitin in its name, deriving from crab. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing, but this story has a lot of interesting things going on in it. And, and this is one of the only labors that specifically explain one of the constellations and really links to a constellation directly in the mythology, which happens to be Carcanos, which is where we get cancer from. And then you have these sort of possible etymology connections and reasonings for, for things, such as cancer being fungus and crabs having some sort of fungal relationship. And that kind of recognition linguistically through the name of cancer and canker. Um, and then you have this multifaceted web-like dragon whose blood is toxic. Pharmacaea and astrology. Astrology functioned as a source book on physiology and zoology as well as plant medicine and toxins. They all had ruling zodiacs, as well as each individual human. Not only did your tree and your medicines and your animals and yourself have ruling zodiacs and times when certain events were supported or conflicting, you also had how to administer and what was represented by those, those toxins, which shamanic sort of animal form personification matched with the zoomorphic diseases or plants or medicines that you had to give to your person, to a sick person or, or something. Only those initiated in the cults or people like the magi, or sorcerers, prophets, oracles, witches, etc. Only they knew how to harvest and use those. And it was always based on the zodiac, the constellation was a reflection of the sort of microcosm of herbal, poison, psychedelic knowledge. A lot of these, especially the drugs and poisons, they didn't have common taxonomical names. They had folk names. They had puns. They had hidden names that were represented by animals, as well as the diseases represented by animals and different sorts of names, like canker and cancer. The zodiac structures are time only as a wheel, seasons are repeated, Amenita is often depicted as a wheel as well, like we saw with Ixion, and at any time there's a sun, halo, disc, wheel, mushroom, calendar, zodiac, they kind of all, oftentimes, some or all of these themes fit into one single wheel. In that kind of sense, one of these initiated 
sorcerers, prophets, magi, oracles, or witches could read a wheel kind of like a codex. If you knew the time of the year, you knew the constellations the sun was in, and you knew the disease and the person and the plant, you could construct a cure. And these kind of loosely strung together equations gives us our mythology of um, strange events happening like a hydra that grows its head back with a crab friend and then you kill the hydra by stuffing fire into its wounds and then you can dip its blood in and get a poison from it which are, comes across as very strange until you realize they're sort of these pharmacaea stories from post-shamanic and fertility cults. In conclusion, understanding the explicit taxonomy of toxological, pharmaceutical, and entheogenic substances, zoomorphed and given heavenly representation via the constellations is the next step. We may understand that there's more to this story, that it is a pharmacaea, but what exactly that specific use and disease and function of those possible pharmaceutical entheogenic substances are is, is a different question and one, and one which is um, likely to feature something like the Amanita muscaria. The cycle of 12 repeats itself throughout religions such as with the 12 apostles of Jesus. Each apostle was an animal and a constellation. The story of Heracles is one of the oldest of the Greek cultures and encompasses many of the central myths of Greco-Roman religions, and by extension many European folkloric stories, beliefs, and medicines. That Heracles is an aphorism of ancient fungal and herbal knowledge is the primary reason for our mythological interest, and one that is due further investigation. Heracles is, and his labors are far more important mythological tale than, than just this story of um, punishment and redemption and arduous impossible tasks and overcoming them. There is a deeper astrological and pharmacaea to it. Um, there's an interesting article I found about Heracles and this story and um, you can check it out there but the slideshow will be available if you want to take a look at it. Yep, yeah, that's it, so thanks for watching.